All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Gedaspov. I'm uh, executive director of uh, Vicente Ferrer Foundation USA. It's a small nonprofit foundation which works together with Rural Development Trust, our partner in India. Rural Development Trust, or we call it RDT, it was founded 50, over 50 years ago, 1969, by Vicente and Anne Ferrer. And um, since then, we empowered more than 3.6 million people in rural India. Kerry, for hosting this, uh, this first webinar by VFF USA. The webinar will be structured in a way that we'll have three uh, uh, distinguished speakers and panelists. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Kerry first, and then we'll see a short video about uh, VFF USA, two minute video, just to see the scope of work we do in India. And then I'll just pass it on to Kerry. <laughs> India is home to 1.3 billion people with 369 million living below the poverty line. The most vulnerable groups are people who live in rural areas, women, children, and people with disabilities. In the rural areas of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, agriculture is the main source of income. Drought is a scourge the region has suffered from for decades. The livelihood of millions of farmers depends on erratic rainfalls, which makes it difficult to break the cycle of poverty. Vicente Ferrer Foundation USA is committed to combating poverty and improving the lives of rural communities. We use a holistic approach to fund sustainable development programs in dialogue with the communities in need. Our approach encompasses six main areas. We train and empower women to advocate for themselves and open their own businesses so that they can provide alternative incomes for their families. We build new houses with sanitation facilities and water purification systems to contain diseases. We plant trees to preserve the environment and provide micro irrigation systems to improve the livelihood of farmers. We support people with disabilities by providing training and job opportunities. We believe everyone deserves a chance to realize his or her full potential. We provide education to children and plant the seeds of change and hope for a better future. We provide nutrition support and affordable health care to disadvantaged rural communities. We work to combat poverty suffering and injustice will you join us yeah thank you so much for that introduction andre and yeah it's been a pleasure to um, be on the board of the ff usa and watch it um, really grow over the years and um, happy to be hosting this webinar um, so we're hoping to continue to spread the word about the work we're doing um, so why uh, women's empowerment today? And um, as most of you know, March is a really big month for women. Um, we've had uh, International Women's Day a few um, weeks ago to celebrate women around the world. It's also National Women's History Month um, here in the United States. So we thought this was a good time to really um, shed a spotlight on um, women and especially women in rural India, because as many of you know, it's a very can be a very patriarchal society. And even though women um, do legally have equal rights to men, um, they still are often at disadvantage. Um, so we're here to talk some more about that. Um, we invited um, some men in the audience, but also a lot of women. We invited you specifically because I think a lot of you are already involved in your communities, empowering women, empowering youth, empowering um, just overall communities. So we thought you would be interested um, in what we have to share with you today. And we also, as Andre mentioned, have three very distinguished um, panelists who also are um, big proponents of women's empowerment and have made contributions, um, big contributions in their individual fields and are also um, great supporters of um, Vicente Ferrer Foundation and Rural Development Trust. So we have Dr. Srile Kapale, Mariam Ugarte, and Vanessa Jacklich, and we'll, I'll be introducing them in a little more detail um, soon. So today I'm going to give a little more detail just to like talk more about what you just saw in the video and just give you some statistics on um, the work we've done. And then each panelist is going to share their story individually. So please um, feel free to put questions into the chat 
while they're talking and we'll try to answer those after they've um, spoken. And then at the end, we'll bring everybody back together, including Andre to answer um, specific questions or also general questions you have about BFF USA. And finally, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end to just talk to you about how you can get involved. If you have the time and um, interest, we'd love to have um, your support. And some of you are already supporting us, so thank you for that. Um, so as Andre mentioned, we our work that we support is all in South India. And just for those of you who aren't super familiar with the geography of India, India, this is where the work is being done. So Andhra Pradesh and neighboring Telangana, both in South um, India. And so um, VFF USA is, you know, a specific nonprofit that we are um, supporting this work, right? And, and um, humaning donors here in the US and, and Canada. Okay, so these are the areas we support. Most of them are mentioned in the video you saw, but there's a couple extra ones I'll talk about um, in a couple minutes. But I wanted to focus a little bit on our women's um, empowerment work that we support. And so some of the here's some of the projects um, that are going on in India today. Um, there are self-help groups. They're called sanghams um, locally. They're groups of women who can get together and discuss um, problems, concerns they have, health issues, economic issues. Um, and through that, there is a lot of economic development work that is going on. There are workshops and things um, held for these women so they can learn how to manage their finance, finances, um, learn how to apply for government loans. And also the Rural Development Trust has its own, uh, I think it's called the Women's Development Fund. So they provide their own loans to these women to help them start businesses and become financially independent or at least have income. Um, as many of you know, around the world, gender-based violence is a huge issue. So rural India is uh, no exception to that. Um, so there are a lot of programs to help sensitize men in the community to gender-based violence, also to just raise awareness about adolescents, try to prevent it early on. And also part of that work are social action teams that are being put together in rural India. They're, they're, short, they're small teams of um, equal men and women, and they're trained to be able to um, identify um, gender-based discrimination or violence that is going on. And they're also trained to um, you know, help the people who are experiencing that find the help they need. Um, and one of those ways is through counseling centers and shelters. Um, um, VFF and RDT um, supports quite a few counseling centers and shelters for not only women, but um, everyone who's um, gone through trauma or types of violence and needs some help. And then also widows is a big area. So there's a lot of marginalized populations in India, especially among women and widows is one of them. So when a, a woman's spouse dies, she's awfully, often left um, very alone, right? And needs a lot of support. So, Given all of those programs that are going on, these are three um, specific projects that VFF USA has donor programs um, right now for. One is a tailoring project. So we are helping about 14, 15 women per year. We train them, give them a sewing machine and uh, train them how to tailor and also start their own businesses. So that helps them um, generate income. We also have a widow's project that's specifically giving nutrition support to widows. And I think in 2019 and 2020, we provided nutrition support to 205 marginalized women. Most of them were widows. And then we also have currently an eight women, eight wishes campaign that's going on. And it's a more uh, general program we'll talk about a little more later on, but you can choose where you want to give your support to women, what can be nutrition, education, or healthcare. I think Miriam's going to talk a little bit about that. And then at the very end of the presentation, I'll, I'll give more details as well. So real quick, before we get to the panelists, here are just some statistics from each of the sectors we work in. There are many other statistics, but I just picked out some I, I thought were really interesting. So in our women's empowerment sector, um, so far, $1.6 million in loans have been granted to women through the um, Women's Development Fund that I mentioned um, that RRDT provides to help women become financially independent. Um, we have built houses. You heard that in the video in 2019, more than 3,000 houses were built. And I find this statistic 
really exciting that more than 90% of the houses we built were registered in a woman's name. So many of these were widows too. So they, um, it gives, it really empowers a woman to have a house in her name, right? A huge asset to have. In our ecology and sustainability livelihood sector, um, you heard there's a lot of drought um, in this area of rural India. So we've uh, planned to help plant more than 400,000 trees to help farmers reach sustainable incomes. A lot of these are tamarind trees. They grow really well in um, drought conditions. Um, you heard that we have uh, a lot of inclusion of people with disabilities. So just in 2018 alone, more than 4,000 people with disabilities were able to attend school in rural India. And we actually support seven schools that are specifically for um, children who have um, vision impairment, um, auditory impairment, or other physical disabilities. So it's really great. I've been to India and it's just amazing to see the schools and the kids and what they're doing. In them. Um, and then along the lines, education's a huge focus. Um, in India, as in many rural communities, um, women are, or girls are at a higher risk of dropping out of school early than boys are. Um, partly because they may be needed in the home and things and they, they live far from school. So we've um, supported the distribution of many, many bicycles to help um, girls and all students be able to get to school from their remote villages. Schools are often really, really far. And I know we have a lot of sports enthusiasts here in the audience. So we also have a huge sports program. Um, it's really impressive. We have a huge tennis um, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a, just a, a lot of tennis courts, tennis programs, there's soccer, all kinds of things. So it, just in 2018 alone, um, more than 10,000 children have participated in some of these programs. Community health, as you can imagine, is also a big area of focus. This is again, just one small statistic, but we have more than a thousand community health workers that are trained and they deploy, they go out to the different villages um, and they can, uh, they're not like credentialed health workers, but they are trained to be able to identify common diseases and things like that, help women get help. They also can take temperatures and things like that and um, also educate women and men and children about community health issues. And in relatedly, we have a big focus on rural hospitals. Um, interestingly, 62%, so more than half of the patients in the hospitals we support are women. Um, and we, the uh, hospitals in our network uh, treat about 2,700 patients annually. There are three hospitals that VFF um, supports in rural India. And that brings us to our first panelists who has been involved quite a bit in that sector. Um, Dr. Srile Kapale is a, she has a doctorate in physical therapy and also an MBA. And she's a physical therapist and a leader in both healthcare communities and the Indian American community. She's a former vice president of the South Asian Public Health Association. And currently she's director of rehabilitation services at a major healthcare organization in the Washington DC area where she's joining us from today. She also is the owner of her own business called VCare Home Healthcare Services. Um, she assists elderly individuals with companionship, transportation, meals, and other daily living needs, because it's also a very um, vulnerable population. She supports, and she's been working with Vicente Ferrer Foundation for several years um, to help improve physical therapy services in the rural hospitals that we support. Um, so I'd like to join, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Srileka Pale. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and hopefully she can, she, hopefully she will show up on your screen in a minute. I have some questions for Srileka. Um, one thing that's uh, really interesting and unique about Srileka is that she knows what it's like to grow up in rural India um, because she actually did. So I was hoping um, Srileka, you could tell us, there you are, hi, um, more about uh, where you were born, what it was like growing up in rural India and how your upbringing has affected um, who you are today. Thank you. Hello, namaste to all. 
acknowledge to all the people that are residing in US, Spain, India, and I just realized that uh, there is a, a, a person from Canada as well. Thank you to one and all, and uh, most of all, thanks to um, Andre and Kerry for arranging that. It's just my pleasure and honor to be part of uh, our DP. I think going back to Kerry, I did grow up in a small town called Betham Chadla. It is a part of Rail Sima, about two and a half, three hours from Anantapur. Um, I, I believe uh, Karnul, uh, Kadapan, Anantapur are something that are very close to my heart because I just kind of grew up there and uh, got educated up until my 12th grade in that same uh, Rail Sima region. And then I did go to Karnataka, which is a neighboring state to study my physical therapy degree. I think um, uh, if I have to kind of uh, put it up why I, I feel so passionate about this cause is uh, coming from just a middle class and upper middle class family uh, and being able to be educated in moderately larger towns or cities provides you a very unique perspective on what privilege looks like and feels like. You have, uh, you, definitely become more humble after that experience. You go to Mangalore, where I got my physical therapy degree from. You go to hospitals such as Manipal, which is again considered to be a metropolitan city, where a lot, lot of non-resident Indians come to study. And you see this uh, world-class uh, healthcare in private and corporate hospitals, where majority of the people that are living there are upper middle class or rich people that are able to afford that kind of world-class healthcare. And then you come back to your little town, which is Betham Charla, Karnul, Anantapur, and Karapa, and you just realize that there is uh, that section of um, our own people that can't afford that kind of world-class healthcare. And frankly speaking, uh, getting low-grade healthcare system and just not having the lifestyle, quality lifestyle that you witness majority of your life. So I think that's what made me very humble. And that was kind of my experience for the first part of my 20 years of life living in India. And that's precisely why I was so, um, when I heard about our DT, my heart went out to the mission where they feel like passionate belief that change, not charity is the path. So that's just how my association with our DT began. Yeah, thanks. So when exactly did you hear about um, RDT? How old were you? Or when? So, yeah, believe it or not, I did not hear about RDT back home in India. That's because, again, I come from a very sheltered family where I studied majority of my time in boarding schools. So I came to, when I came to United States about few, about six or seven years back, I, I can't really remember the timeline, a few years back, I, I went to US Impact. There was a summit. The uh, relationships between India and United States were getting discussed. I was invited for that. So I went there. I was standing in line just to kind of grab uh, some snacks. And one of my friends that I went to started speaking to the then executive director, Angie. And, they, mm -hmm. and I kept hearing the word Anantapur and I kept looking behind because I rarely hear that word Anantapur in this. I think by far, that might have been the first time I heard out of my friend's circle. And then I just went to Angie. I said, I can't help but keep hearing Anantapur. I might miss hearing you because Angie is this white girl <laughs> full of life and was kind of talking about it. And she's like, no, we have our organization there. And then, uh, and then the summit started, but I couldn't focus on summit. I was just uh, beyond elated to know that there is an organization working in Anantapur. So I, I literally started stalking her and she responded to me about two weeks after apologizing, basically saying that she had, uh, she was uh, tied up on other projects, but she was intending to get back to me. But within that two week time span, I probably texted her 10 times saying that, what can I do to get involved? I'm just impressed that there is an organization out of Washington DC working in my remote areas, love to be part of it. And that's just how the relationship began. Yeah, that's really neat. And so it's, Part coincidence, part like fate, maybe that you found your way back to um, a similar community. Um, so, so how did so? There's a project you were involved in in the beginning, I think, um, called Prescription for Hope. And I was wondering if you could tell the audience a little bit about how you chose to get involved in that, what it is, and um, how you were involved in that. Sure, Gary. Prescription for Hope is a, like an expertise exchange program in which healthcare professionals from around the world travel to BFF's hospitals in India, I believe Kerry just showed those three hospitals, to share their wealth of knowledge and, uh, with local providers and also gain knowledge from local providers. 
the thing that truly impressed me about those hospitals that I shadowed for a week or two was how clean and what quality of healthcare was being provided and a passionate healthcare that was provided. Uh, just within the campus, one thing that really struck me is uh, there was this huge line to uh, in front of pharmacy store. Outside of that campus, you will basically, if you kind of know Indian culture, people want to get ahead in line and they don't want to stand and uh, stick to the line. But within the campus of the hospital, I was just impressed of how disciplined people were standing in the line. That just made me uh, that I, I think it's all about the mission. If people believe in the mission, they'll follow through everything that you ask them to do it. So uh, basically, this is, again, expertise exchange program. Along with me, there was a cardiologist when I went in two years back. Um, and when I traveled to Anantapur, shadowing uh, doctors and physical therapists, we did some uh, screening camps and rehabilitation clinics where orthopedists from London was present. Uh, we also did a lot of other women empowerment projects and worked on them. But basically, this is a way for us to offer our expertise and recommendation and also some gain some knowledge. Through that process, I understood um, more about the infectious control practices and also try to understand more about where the lack of infectious diseases processes is coming from. So I was able to come here and send some materials from here in order to ensure that uh, we get that program started in our, our DT hospital. Yeah, that's great. So even though your specialty is physical therapy, you're able to help in so many other ways and, and just medicine in general improve. That's great. Um, I, I did want you to share with us too, like some of the other work you've done since then. So I know, you know, that inspired you even more and you've done a lot of work and a lot of support um, since um, that program. So can you tell us a little bit more about Sure, Carrie. I, I think more than anything, I enjoyed the women's core team. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I know feminist is not a very great word in, in this day and age, but I always consider myself as supporting more of women and children and people with disabilities. That's basically how I got into physical medicine rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really kind of enjoyed the, the sports aspect of it, where for where girls, teenage girls felt empowered that they can get somewhere if they only put the hard work and the discipline that came with those sports and uh, sports uh, places. The women's sport team, as you know, it was formed by senior women staff members from all the departments and cater. And I felt that it created a space for women staff members to exp express freely. And Kerry, I think you started off saying that it is a patriarchal society. No, um, India has kind of come way far than when I lived there 20 okay. years back. But I still think there is certain a uh, certain aspect of patriarchal society, and it's more in the rural areas. But this women core uh, team gives them the confidence, like self care, uh, uh, sangams is what they call. They kind of all the like minded women empowering each other, and then they have the space they, the space not only to discuss, but also they're building training and capacity building. They're influencing the teams to improve and participate and take care of themselves and their health. That, their maternal health, their infant health, and also trying to incorporate the incorporate gender approach in all these activities. I think that's what was uh, something yeah. that I'd really cherish going back and serving and being with those women. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad you've been able to spend so much time there and contribute so much. Um, I wanted to show the audience a couple photos we had of you, um, some of your work there, and maybe you can, um, Tell us a little bit more about some of it. Let me see, like here's a photo. I just was wondering, I thought people might like to see rather than just hear what you were doing. Sure. So do you remember what that what was going on in this situation? Or? Yeah, a patient actually it was go, having, having severe back pain. So that's like one of the piece of equipment people that have gone through physical therapy kind of understands. It's like an electrical stimulation mm -hmm. modality, we call it as um, physical medicine modality where we are trying to work on pain and stuff. That's a physical therapist, Mohan, amazing physical therapist. Uh, he was able to kind of identify um, and was screening based on his intervention and plan of care. Okay, great. Here's another one. Uh, th this was actually a gentleman. I, I remember I had a very good conversation. I think it uh, helps me because I understand the language mm -hmm. and I speak the language very well. And I actually love to speak that language. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think I had a wonderful conversation. I felt like it was, uh, um, he came from a village and um, obviously he went through knee replacement and was um, exercising along with the physical therapist. But one thing that he would continues to ask me is if I, if he'll be ever able to 
squat because that's what uh, it requires for him to continue with his agriculture. Okay, wow. Yeah, I know we don't think of some of these things, right? Why would you need to squat? There's so many reasons you, he needs to squat for his livelihood. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And also, um, uh, you've also helped support us in our VFFUSA in getting equipment, more equipment for some of the rural areas. So I'm not that familiar with this equipment. I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, the equipment that's needed there, why, or what these types of equipment are. The hospital for the rural hospital, I felt like they had good equipment, but like any other clinics, even in my own clinic, I manage uh, physical medicine and cardiac and pulmonary rehab. We are always enhancing our equipment. So never to degrade one equipment or other, but that was a newer equipment that uh, we were able to collect funds and develop. It's uh, for strengthening of your lower extremities. And that's more of a posture standing and doing a lot of hand therapy rehabilitation. Okay. Um, Oh, this one has this hand therapy? Yes. Okay, that's interesting in this yeah, one. That's parallel bars, ramps, as you know, especially in India, uh, it's not very ADA accessible. So it's uh, imperative that we have a ramp in every physical therapy or rehabilitation clinic. So we practice uh, going up and down the ramp. So that's just how the life in India bega begins. We don't have the, uh, again, ADA, uh, ADA's, uh, ADA accessibility is very limited um, in rural parts of the country, so they should be able to do that before they completely graduate from rehab. Yeah, okay. So that's great. Yeah, I just wanted everybody to know the, yeah, the impact you're having. It's really wonderful. Um, if I may carry a couple of things that we are still looking to buy for that um, uh, yeah. rehabilitation gym is laser piece of equipment. Uh, in the United States, laser piece of equipment can go anywhere between $2,000 to $5,000. But I know in India, you could bargain it for lesser price. Mm -hmm. So if anybody is willing to make a donation, please contact either Carrie or Andre, or uh, you can reach out to me as well. That's one piece of equipment I really think, uh, was uh, planning to get it in 2019, but my I had a different priority in 2020 COVID hit, so I didn't want to keep going back to folks asking for donation, but that's something that I really intend to bring it back to the rehabilitation area. Okay, no, that's great. Yeah, we'll definitely, after this, we're going to send an email out to everybody, just a kind of recap of what we talked about, and we'll add that to that as well. Thank you very, very much, Miriam Ugarte. And Miriam is joining us from Montreal, Canada today. Um, she's an educator and clinical student supervisor at the Pearson Adult and Career Center in La Salle, uh, Quebec, and where she teaches in the nursing patient care attendant and home care programs. She has a very um, long and extensive background in nursing. She's also worked as a nursing consultant and registered nurse in a um, variety of clinical areas. She's uh, helped provide care for uh, people recovering from surgery and uh, pre and post delivery care for high risk pregnant women and their babies, just to name a few areas. Um, she's also taught and designed several nursing courses for the Rural Development Trust and is a dedicated supporter of our initiatives to empower women. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to Miriam now and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about how she got involved in um, BFF USA and all of the work she's been involved with um, in India. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Hello, so my name is Miriam, and I got involved with RDT by watching television. I saw them uh, advertising Rural Development Trust, and I thought, wow, an organization that works in India, and it's from Spain. So I thought, oh, it's a win-win situation for me, because all my life I wanted to work in India since I was a little girl. And so I wrote to them, and they said, come as a teacher. So I went, I taught an um, updating course for labor and delivery room nurses in two of their, their hospitals in 2014. And I was impressed with the nurses, how, how hard they work. They have more patients than us. The patients are sicker than the patients we have. And they have more responsibility than we have anywhere. And so, and the course was uh, in English. And I didn't know how much English they would have, right? So because I was worried about whether they would understand me or not, I brought a lot of hand, hand on things and a lot of things that would be visual. And so this was very good because the nurses, they say yes to everything. And then sometimes it's not. 
yes, it's no, but they don't say no. So you don't really know how to assess whether they do understand you or not. So we did a lot of hands-on and a lot of visual things. And it was very good. And I was really, I fell in love with RDT and their values and how they work with people, how they want to eradicate uh, poverty and how they want to empower women so much that I went back. I went back uh, three more times. So I've been to RDT four times in total. And I went to do my field work for my master's. And so I work with the nurses in one of the smaller hospitals in Caliandor. And this was amazing. And it was very difficult. One of the part of my uh, master's was to do a survey on what do they need to change. So when I asked them, what would you like to change? They said nothing. Everything is perfect. So it was in, almost impossible to get a straight answer. And so what I did, I thought after thinking and thinking, I thought, well, it seems like they need to work on communication <laughs> because they say everything is perfect. And no, nothing is ever perfect in an organization, right? So we started working on communication among the nurses and the different management levels. Um, hierarchy is really very, very, you can see it very much. And so we worked with doctors and managers because there's a big uh, hierarchical level. And um, I did a lot of uh, things to to break uh, barriers. For example, I did a lot of improv and we used a lot of art, which is more conducive to expression. It's a, a tool that it's universal and whether you speak good English or not, and whether you realize or not, at the end you are passing a message. So that was very useful. And then I recently went in the Christmas of 2000, 2020, not this one, the previous one, and we worked on the, with another midwife from Spain, we worked on the guidelines from the WHO on humanizing labor and delivery. So we worked on very important things like uh, promoting autonomy for women, uh, consent, which is really important. And part of our job is we need nurses to believe that they have a power to decide because they need to then pass that on to their patients. But they first need to believe in themselves. So we, part of our work is empowering the nurses themselves in order for them to be able to give respect and to give, to ask for consent. They need to understand that it's important to ask women for consent, but they first need to believe it. Otherwise they will not carry that work on. So mm -hmm. it's been a very gratifying experience for me uh every time I it's funny because people tell me how come um it must be really hard for you to work with people who are so different in India and every time I go to India I think you know <laughs> they're not that different they're very much similar they're more similar than different we all have we all want to be safe in life we all want to have a meaningful job we all want to have food on our table. We want our children to go to school. We all want love. And that's what people from India want too. So every time I go, I feel they are very much like me. <laughs> so it's been a very gratifying experience for me. And I feel that every time I go, I grow as a person, as a teacher, and as a nurse. Oh, that's wonderful. I know it's been hard with COVID. You haven't obviously been able to go. Yeah, we can go. I I know. Know. We're I know. Are you hoping? Are you? When are you hoping to be able to go back? Do you have any plans? We don't know when we're going, but we're already working with uh, nurses to see if we can help. Um, they in India right now. They don't think they're going to get a second wave in the south of India. No. And we're saying, okay, maybe you don't get a second wave. I hope there's a miracle for you guys because you do deserve it. No. But if there is COVID again, can we prepare faster? Than uh, can we be more ready than last time? Because last time it was really it was very traumatic. The uh, RDT did an amazing job. They were even giving a medal from the government, but uh, it was really hard because uh, I mean they even had to have people controlling the crowd, yeah. get into the hospital. They had to feed people that were outside who had no place to sleep, no place to eat, and 
no hospital that would take them. So it was really very, very traumatic. And a lot of people quit and it was, so they did an amazing work. And so we would like to support them to see if this time it could be a little smoother. Right. Okay. Well, yes. Good luck with that. I hope it works out. I hope everything opens up everywhere soon. Um, I wanted to show, I have some really interesting photos mm -hmm. as well of uh, some of your time. I wanted to share those with, um, just one second with the audience and um, especially you, you mentioned your work with the arts. Um, but anyway, I was hoping you yeah, could so, like, narrate so, these moments. <laughs> so this, we're doing puzzles in the floor because a lot of nurses, nurses are trained in English, but their verbal skills sometimes in English is not that good. So mm -hmm. I thought if they cannot speak, at least they can do, they, they can do things that are hands-on and visual. So th we're doing puzzles about words and definitions on the floor. And so this was very, they never had a teacher like me. So they were like, like they had, I remember the first day the nursing supervisor had this little podium for me to give lecture like a class. And I said, no, no, take the podium away. I'm never going to use that. I'm going to be with the nurses on the floor. And because we didn't have tables. So we used the floor was our table. And um, it, it went very well because the nurses thought, wow, she's really different, this teacher. <laughs> So they really got into it and they really liked uh, doing hands-on activities and learning in a different way. So, yeah, it makes everybody learns different ways and you don't always tap into right. yeah. something learns, so it's great. And that way I, could, I didn't lose any student because whether they speak English or not that well, they were, everybody could participate. So it was really helpful. That's great. Yeah, and, and this is a, a we every time we did a session with the nurses, we would start by being in a circle, and everybody uh, had a chance to say how they were doing. So we would ask, I would ask a question, or if anybody had a question or a comment, and we would go around. So it was trying to uh, encourage participation and giving everybody a voice. And so if they didn't have anything to say, I, I would pass a stone, a little stone, and they would hold it. And if they didn't have anything to say, they would pass it for, to the next person. But if later on they wanted the stone, then we would give the stone back. And so people got used to saying things, even though it wasn't that important or heavy, but just having a voice and saying how they were feeling today or how did their shift go? Because a lot of the nurses come after their shift. So I wanted to know how was the work today or how are you doing? Or And sometimes I would ask just off the wall questions. So it would change a little bit the vibe in the conversation. So it was a, it was a good way to get to know everybody. So at the beginning and at the end, we would have circle time and we would talk to each other just like normal people. That's great. Yeah, I love that you use so many different ways to tap into people and get them to communicate. And this is another one, I think, because I think these are you took them on field trips, right? Yeah. So what happened was because I kept asking questions on a survey and they felt very intimidated in a survey kind of questions. I thought this is not working. So I asked the chief, can we go on a field trip or something? He said, sure. So he gave me a van and we went to this um we went to this temple and we had to walk up and everything. And on the way back, we sat down and we had lunch, okay? And they gave us curd rice, but we didn't have spoons or, or, or plates or anything. I'm like, how are you gonna eat curd rice? Like with your hands and the milk is like, it was just crazy. So we had a lot of fun eating curd rice. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, we saw these shepherds passing by and they were just wearing, a loincloth and they had their goats on and the maintenance guy said to me because he came with us um Miriam can we give them some food and I thought some food we're gonna give them everything but how do you give curd rice away so we were looking for bags or containers and we all started getting into this and then I thought wow this at the end this kind of connected us more than anything else because mm -hmm. it seemed like we all have the same values and we wanted to help people mm -hmm. and so this was a great experience because I had no translator this day and so we had to be able to connect as we could and it did work um, I did another field trip to a lake and it started getting the nurses to feel okay she's she's like ah uh, she's human and you know it get, it gave us more of a connection so it was a, a good start to yeah. start communicating. 
That's wonderful. Yeah, and here you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned earlier, you used puppets and things. Yes. So oh. I use puppets. I did some research and puppets have a long history in India. Uh, they even say that maybe they were invented, it's not clear, in India or in China. And RDT, Vicente Ferreira, at the beginning, used theater also to talk to people. And so I thought maybe if we make puppets, they will forget that it's them talking mm -hmm. and the puppet will take away and will have a voice of its own. And so it happened. So we started playing. I use a lot of play because I think the nurses, when they come to our sessions, they're already tired from overwork. And so I want them to have a fun time. I want them to be to, to want to come to my class. And so we did something that was a uh, paper puppets. And then we made even more difficult puppets, but this was the beginning. And they people they forget that they're talking. And so they at the end they start talking about their problems, even though it's through a puppet, they feel less intimidated. And so this was a great tool to to use. So yeah, I liked using puppets. Yeah. That's great. And then I have one more photo and you can see the Rangolis on the, on the. Ground. Yes. And so this is the end of the project. <laughs> and uh, because it was on communication at the end, we did something together because uh, in the picture, there's a lot of doctors, residents and nurses. And because it was to break barriers of communication and to increase the, what we wanted to do in the project was make work at RDT so pleasant that you don't want to quit. Even though they pay you less than the government, you want to stay here because it is nicer to work here because you have a voice. And when the doctors ask you something, they you can contribute and they take your, your voice into consideration. So the last, uh, the last project was to drop Rangolis on the floor without any, uh, any verbal communication. All they could do was uh, sign or, or, but they did it together. And so nurses, doctors, and residents, they painted all of the floor with Rangolis together, only in, in silence. And it worked beautiful. It was like such a, like I was ready to cry. It was at the end of my project. And I realized, okay, I think now I'm a facilitator because this worked very well. And I was impressed by the strength of uh, and how much they got involved. And I remember um, the guy in blue is the, the chief, Dr. Bala. And he said to me, Miriam, we're drawing. What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know what you're going to do, but this is time to draw. So mm -hmm. finally, because I wasn't paying attention to, because he wanted just to talk to me. And I'm like, no, it's silence. So finally, he went to the steps of the of the building of RDT. And he said, he wrote something like, we are the best team or something like that. And then everybody else came with, a, I don't know what you call the thing that you paint the, it's like, a, I don't know, it's a powder that in different colors, everybody came with all the powder and they colored all the letters inside. And at the end, he was so proud because he did participate, although at the beginning, he's like, what, you want me to draw? Like, I can't draw. <laughs> and then he ended up drawing letters and everybody colored these letters and everybody worked together and it was really beautiful. And yeah. so I think it did work a little bit to strengthen their communication. No, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you for all that work. And we, I can't, we can't wait for you to get back to India and um, do some more. Um, we're gonna have to move on to our next... Um, <laughs> Panelists soon, but I want everybody to know that um, Miriam actually just recently wrote a chapter in a book called Arts as an Agent for Social Change. So, oh, yes, here. I'm very passionate about that. So, <laughs> there it is. So, if you want to learn more about using art, let me know. I'm a big proponent of the arts. So, yeah, let Miriam know and she can tell you more about that. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Vanessa is a journalist and a U.S. correspondent for two Spanish television channels in the DC metropolitan area. She's joining us today from that area. And she's also a contributing anchor and analyst for an international television channel. I hope I'm saying it right. Is it NTN24? Very well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And she's co-founder of the first digital platform for Spanish nationals in the DC area. It's called DC Spaniards. Um, and Vanessa has been an ambassador for the Vicente Fair Foundation for years. And some of you might recognize her um, if you attended our 2019 Recipe for Empowerment Gala, she was the MC for that gala. It was celebrating 50 years of um, our foundation's work in India. 
And she's also a um, supporter of our sponsor child program. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Vanessa. She's going to tell you a little bit about her journey as a woman in a um, predominantly male dominated field, how that's been, and also talk about her experience with sponsoring um, children in India. Thank you, Gary, for the introduction. And of course, uh, thanks so much to the whole team for the invitation. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here today, also participating with you and sharing my brief um, story. And uh, I always say I'm a very proud ambassador of the foundation and uh, now also a proud uh, child sponsor. Um, I was born in Barcelona. So since I can remember, I knew who Vicente Ferrer was. I actually could um, see firsthand like his amazing work and the, the impact that uh, all that work and efforts contribute for a better uh, world through, through that impact actually of the foundation. And of course, the legacy that he left behind. Um, as a journalist, years later, I work uh, currently as a US correspondent, as Kelly mentioned, um, for the newspaper La Razón and also for Telemadrid now here based in Washington, DC. And uh, from that experience firsthand, I could cover not just stories and success stories from people who, who are uh, part also of the foundation, but also as a volunteer, as an MC of that um, annual gala, and now, as I just mentioned, as a proud ambassador of the foundation and being also part of the family as a child sponsor, which is like what for me touched my heart uh, for sure, because I think, through, I think through children and seeing firsthand that evolution and the impact that, that it makes in, in all of them. I mean, for me, I always say the same thing. Uh, my sister and I, since we were born, we were so lucky to have uh, everything we had without even knowing, right? So that access to education, to healthcare systems, and the best actually that we could get around. And uh, we gave it for granted because we were lucky enough to have that without knowing, as I said, thanks to my parents and my family support. So somehow when you grow up and you realize how lucky you were, you need to help others even if it's like a very small um, help for somebody else, just for one kid, uh, I think it changed everything for you. So I feel much more lucky than my little girl, Lavanya, I'm sure, and her family and the entire community who can also um, get profits and benefits from, from my sponsorship in that sense. So of all the... Mm, let's say different things I've done with the foundation. Uh, the one I'm more proud about is this one. I can't wait to go in person after pandemic to meet my little girl, Lavanya. She's now, I think Gary has some picture of her wow. to share. She's now 12 years old. Um, so when I sponsored her last year, she was almost at the last chance she could have to be a sponsor because uh, the limit age is 12 years. She uh, lives in Southern India. It's a place, a little small community called uh, Bilupala. It's in the state of um, Andhra Pradesh, where the foundation is working so hard in that part of rural India. She lives with her family. Uh, his, uh, her father, uh, his name is Chanti. Her mother's name is Salama, and she also has two little sisters. And um, for me, it's amazing thinking every time I share this uh, information with my, you know, my, my family, my close friends and, and people I know through my work. Um, it's amazing thinking how easy it is. I mean, less than $1 every day can change these kids' uh, lives forever. Because uh, that's what, what I pay for her, for example, sharing this information with you, it's less than $30 every month. And thanks to that, not just Lavanya, but also her sisters, her family, like her parents and the entire community can benefit from, from that uh, sponsorship program. Why? Because she has direct access to education 
And actually it's a really good one because um, not just after the 18 years old, uh, she also has healthcare, uh, free healthcare. Not just that, but also until she finished the entire university. So we're talking about 23 years old. I think this is my favorite um, program of all the amazing work I know the foundation is doing. Um, and that's why, I mean, I was very inspired for, for that work. And as I mentioned before, I can't wait to go in person. That will be when everybody's talking about how travel restrictions are in all around the world. I'm like, and, and they are asking you all the time, what's your next trip? Are you traveling soon? I'm like, I can't wait to go to India and be part of uh, everything I'm involved in, but in person because I haven't been there yet. So that's my wish for 2022, hopefully. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And um, I just want to mention too, like you get letters, right? From um, the mm -hmm. um, Yeah, maybe. you have the chance to receive letters from your kids directly. If they are too young to write, they get help, as we can see in a few examples that I sent you. The coordinator there directly can, can write the, the letter for you, for the kit, and sharing all the information you want to know. You can also reply those letters. You can send them pictures. And even once a year, when it's their birthday, um, La Maña is in May, for example, in May the 10th, you have also the chance to send them gifts to India. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it's a very beautiful relationship you can establish with these kids. Um, and you can see firsthand the evolution of that help that you are giving them. Yeah, and it's wonderful because like you do, you 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 participate a lot in inducing gifts and stuff and, and you can do that and it'll make a much closer relationship. But if someone just wants to sponsor financially and they don't have the time to do that, that's okay too. So that's the nice thing about exactly. that. So you can give as much as you can give and you know, it's all appreciated. Um, that's why I was saying it's so easy because if you don't have time or if you don't want to get too much involved um, at some point, you can choose what's the relationship you want to establish with them. Mm -hmm. But it definitely changed their lives forever. For sure. Yeah, it's an amazing program. Yeah, does anybody have any... Um, any questions for Vanessa about this program? I know it's getting, uh, it's about end of our time. So um, maybe it'll be better. Why don't we bring all the panelists? If anybody has any questions, they can put them in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. We can have everybody answer. Let's see. Now we're getting a lot of thank yous in the, in the chat though from people. I know some people might have to go soon, but yeah. Um, I would love to say to all our uh, viewers and audience that is here, participants, that if you have never visited India, this would be the most gratifying. I come from that area, but I still thought living a week or two in that campus was the most gratifying experience I've ever had. Um, you not only obviously get to see the real people, but you kind of tend to see the real impact it makes. And I think that's kind of heartwarming to know. And those are, uh, these are real people, real impact. And that you walk away with the feeling of uh, not only how privileged we are, but also uh, saying that how much they're able to utilize each and every tools and resources they have around them, not only to empower themselves, but to empower the communities that they live in. So I would strongly recommend that, that each of you visit once this COVID is over. Let's hit the nail on the head. If you donate, if you think of a dollar a day, um, I mean, in a big picture, it's really decimal for any of us that are here. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think this is one thing that I plan to do with my own child as I have a middle schooler and a kid that just graduated from high school. I would love for them to kind of do this every birthday, like um, uh, sponsor the child each birthday. So by the time that even their 20 or 30 are impactful area, they're already donating about, uh, they're already sponsoring 20 children. The children can grow up with them. That's something that I really would like to do with my own children starting from this year. But just kind of think about the impact if it starts at one year old, by the time they're 18, the 18 other kids are growing up with them. Uh, what an impact it makes for the children. 
Yeah. And I one last thing, Kerry, and I, I promise I won't say anything else. Oh, no, no, no. One of my hesitancy, although I come from the area, the food and the hygiene part and all, they're all impeccable. Not really the hospitality. The food is they have continental food and Indian traditional food. And the shopping experience is phenomenal. And like Mariam showed, the temples are amazing. So you not only get to enrich your soul and your heart, but you just also experience the entire Indian hospitality. It's just an amazing, um, I mean, I was shocked that you get your own quarters with the running water, running toilets, and uh, it's clean. It's just very nice. If anybody's kind of hesitant about that part of India, I say this campus is completely different. Them. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, and they're always open. Yeah, go ahead, Marion. Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Srilika. Um, when you enter the door of RDT, you feel like you're almost somewhere else because of how clean it is and how it is. But it's not just the how clean it is and how well you're welcome. And, uh, you know, if you're Spanish and you see this Spanish, this uh, Indian woman wearing a, shirt, a sari, but who speaks perfect Spanish, it's really shocking. So <laughs> that's one thing also for the Spaniards that go there. But um, not just that, there's a level of exchange that is not, that you don't see in other organizations. So for example, I the last time I went, because RDT will put you up for three days uh, for free and will show you around, they will lodge you and feed you and show you their programs. But the thing is, when you go into this program, the last time I was there, we went to this faraway place and the village women were talking about how um, they had to go, they had to go and ask permission to get water from the well next door. Okay. And so this connected very closely to one of the Spanish women and she got up and she started talking. And it was very emotional because she said, I come from a poor family. Uh, we were 12 in my family and we also had to walk for water. So I understand very well what you're saying. And you should have seen the audience to think 12 children. We thought only this happened in India, not in Spain. But you should have seen the connection of the women to this person because it's not just us poor people that have to walk for water, not just us having 12 children. There was a real exchange. And this is what I really like about RDT, uh, that you get to meet the people. So every time I go, I, am, I go one or two days to visit their projects and I'm really amazed. I also went to see one of the disabled in schools and there was one teacher who was who used to be a, a student, a blind student, and who now is a teacher in one of their schools. Can you imagine if you live in rural India and you have a child who is disabled and you really have absolute, you're poor and you live in the rural area, you have no hope for this kid. And here comes RDT and they say to you, send your kid to our school, we'll help you. Like this is like heaven's doors open. So, and then you see these children in school with tools and with teachers who are teaching them real things and who have books for blind people and who have all these things for disabled people. And then Spain sends tons of, uh, not just uh, money, they send a lot of people who go and work there and who train people there. So that's a lot of like a... Uh, Dr. Uh, Srilika was saying a lot of the, the the doctors that go from Spain or from other countries, they train the people there and then they leave, but they empower with the new knowledge, the professionals that are there who then stay and work there. 99% uh, of the people who work in RDT are locals. So this is not, this is sustainable work. It's not just it's not charity, it's sustainable work. We are trying to empower people who are from the country itself. So yeah, that's just, really amazing. To kind of riff off that, um, we actually support almost 3,700 villages in India. And like she was saying, they go and pick these kids out of different villages too. And if they need the resources that are at the main campus in Anantapur, they can go to school there. And that's how they help like just a large area of people. Um, we are running a little past time. Um, it's been a really wonderful conversation with everybody. I wanted to um, really quick just 
we'll send these out to um, people though, but you can volunteer, you can visit the campus, you can volunteer at the campuses in India, or you can volunteer in the US. These are some ways um, you can. Um, here's just an example of what you'll see if you go on our website for one of the women's empowerment campaigns I mentioned. You can give as little as $30, you know, it's up to as much as you want, one time, monthly, annually. Um, and then sponsored child, which Vanessa mentioned is less than $30 a month. So less than a dollar a day, you can sponsor one child. Yeah, thank you all for joining. Thank you to our panelists. Um, yeah, and keep in touch. Thank you for having us. Okay, thank you so much. Enjoy your rest of your morning, afternoon, everyone.